I often get asked to run for various elected positions or boards here in Newburgh, but my response is typically that I don't have thick enough skin to handle everything that comes along with politics. And as I'm sure you're aware, Newburgh is pretty evenly split politically uh, with a slight conservative leaning. So political races can be very close and very stressful. And personally, I just don't want to have anything to do with it. But while I don't ever see it in the cards for myself, I do have a lot of respect for people who do run for office, regardless of whether uh, we agree or on everything or not. And there's pretty much no one that agrees with literally everything that I do. So uh, that takes us to today's episode with Newburgh Mayor Bill Rossecker, who took the position of mayor earlier this year. So we'll be talking about what it was like growing up in Newburgh, what ultimately made him decide to run for mayor, along with topics like homelessness, civility, uh, SDCs, which are different utility fees here in Newburgh that everyone uh, wants to be lower, and also the vision for the future of Newburgh. Hi, I'm Daniel Roberts. I'm a local realtor in Newburgh and a member of several organizations in Newburgh where I get to interact with some really amazing people and share their stories on this podcast. I also have the Living in Newburgh YouTube channel, which is all about what it's like living in Newburgh. So if you like these podcasts, then you'll probably enjoy that channel as well. I love this town. I love helping people move here. And I love helping people learn about our amazing community. And I do this podcast because I want to share all the great organizations and people who make this town the great place that it is. And that's the heart and soul of this podcast, to share stories of hope and generosity in Newburgh and the surrounding area to help people be inspired get involved and ultimately have hope for our future. So I hope you enjoy today's conversation with Mayor Bill Rossecker as we talk about Newburgh. All right. Well, Bill, thank you for joining me. It's fun to uh, finally have a sit down and, and talk to the new mayor of Newburgh. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah. I, uh, I look for opportunities to talk to the to the citizen. Yeah. It's uh, a great opportunity. I appreciate it. Well, last time I talked to the mayor was Rick Rogers, who I know you guys ran against each other in the last election, and um, and now you're the mayor, and so you'll come with a different perspective on on everything. So I look forward to sharing uh, sharing your thoughts and everything with our town. Um, but you grew up in in Newburgh, right? So tell me how things changed in in Newburgh since you were a kid to now. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I'm an old guy, so. <laughs> I, I moved here, I think it was in 64 on my fourth birthday. Um, so, I, uh, boy, when I was a, a kid, uh, of course, going, I, I mean, I was in, involved in shooting sports. Uh, I was a member of the 4-H uh, rifle team, and uh, we had our, our own animals. I grew up on 10 acres just outside the city of Newburgh, and we had our animals from 4-H and FFA and all that good stuff. Um, boy, the way that, uh, the town has changed is, I mean, population, you know, when I first moved here, I think the town was about 6,800 people. Oh, wow. Okay. And we are over 25,000 now. So as you can imagine, things have changed, you know, it feels that I used to uh, play around and hunt pheasants on are now, uh, for the most part housing and, uh, you know, their neighborhoods and, uh, you know, well, just speaking of that particular article, when I was in high school. A lot of people came to high school with a rifle racks in the back window of their pickup, <laughs> and and uh, sometimes uh, you know those were used in the in the evening, and people actually had rifles. And of course, nobody ever worried about stealing them or getting them stolen. And and uh, uh, there was a lot of trust in those days. People assumed that people were you know trying to do good. Uh, there were bad people, but it didn't seem to be at the forefront that it is today. I think the internet has change that a lot the uh 24-hour news cycle yeah well it's, it's interesting you mentioned that as kind of an aside back in the day before every single thing was covered maybe there were still things happening but we didn't know about it whereas now it's we're aware and maybe we take more precaution but we're also I feel like a lot more nervous and scared because we see every single little thing that happens so maybe don't, we don't need to get too much into that <laughs> Well, the, the truth is that we are living in the safest time that this, you know, have ever been in this country. And yet, because we are so attuned to the news being on all the time, we, we really feel that it's a lot more dangerous you know, yeah. than it is because we hear about everything. Yeah. Well, even in Newburgh. So I, I recently did a video for my, um, my Living in Newburgh YouTube channel. And Newburgh is actually the fourth safest town in Oregon. I think a lot of people don't recognize that even among Oregon, we are also in a very safe town. 
but every little every little suspicious thing then gets kind of blown out of the Porsche. <laughs> I think we're a, a little bit spoiled, honestly. But um, well, the police chief Kozmicki would like you to know that we're working on number one. So okay, well that's awesome, and I'll maybe uh, I'll have to have to him on here sometime. So. As a kid, I mean, you moved here when you were four years old. Mm-hmm. Did you ever imagine yourself becoming mayor or is that something that happened later on? You know, I've thought about that question a lot because I don't remember ever having those thoughts. Uh, that being said, I think everybody has said at some point in their life, man, I could do a better job <laughs> than that guy. You know, and I, and I don't, I'm not even talking about the last mayor, just, just you know. But no, I, I, uh, I never saw myself uh, running for office of any type, especially not Mayor of Newport. Were you always like kind of an outspoken, like were you always someone who, you know, shared your opinions like in, in high school or were you like someone who liked being on stage or were you more of like a, in the background kind of person? I never liked being on stage. In fact, uh, public speaking is nothing that I, is something I, I was never interested or, or felt that I was good at. In fact, after I got elected, I joined Toastmasters okay. to work on those skills and now I can get in front of a, of a crowd without feeling like I'm going to, you know soil myself <laughs> uh that's been a help but uh yeah i i've always been opinionated uh, in fact the people i went to high school with would be happy to to uh to tell you that that's the truth um i've been involved in in city government uh, i've lived in and outside the city most of my life and uh, every time i've been inside the city i w- i have been involved i've been on budget committee i've been on downtown uh, redevelopment committee and and some other things, and uh, I've always I've always uh, been interested in how our government works. Yeah. So, what ultimately led you to decide to run for mayor? Then, <laughs> one day I was uh, oh gosh, just over about a year and a half ago, I was watching a city council meeting on Zoom. We were all shut down at the time, and uh, I heard the mayor ask just a random question: "What is car camping?" And I thought, man, that's an interesting question. Why would he do that? He got his answer. That was the end of that discussion. We moved on. So I uh, I called him or, or sent him an email, and we sat down and talked about it. And uh, he uh, he indicated that he thought that we needed to allow people to live in their cars in Newburgh and possibly in tents and the parks and the public areas. And I suggested I didn't think that was a very good idea. And apparently we just disagreed on that. So... Uh, Come to find out that the city of Newburgh uh, was working on a car camping initiative, and they were well uh, on the way to institutionalizing car camping in Newburgh and tent camping in our streets, and that was kind of that was kind of what made me decide to become more involved. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Maybe we can touch on that a little bit later because i i'm sure there's there's nuance to that and i'm i know at least here in newberg there are a lot of different opinions and i think it's i think it's worth having a discussion about um and you know on that note though with different opinions you know there's in any election and people ask me all the time to run for different things and i i'm like look running for uh, running for any office is a really great way to make half the town hate you pretty much immediately and and so i admire anyone who does that because and this is what I say is like, I, I don't mind if people don't like me for just because they disagree. But when people are going around spreading mistruths or misinformation, that would be really difficult. I'm sure you experienced some of that as well. I, I know both sides always, were there any specific things that are like, yeah, people are saying this, it's just not true. Well, um, I learned, I spent too much time on Facebook during the pandemic and, uh, it was interesting to me how you could make a statement and then somebody would take it as an argument and try to go a different direction and start an argument with me uh, with anybody. And uh, I, uh, I just didn't didn't care for that. You know, I thought that if I give you an opinion that you know you can agree or disagree, but let's respect the opinion and, and continue the conversation. So uh, I have learned not to pay too much attention to people who. You know, just spout things because, for whatever reason, if they're off topic and and uh, to, you know a lot of times deceitful, then there's just nothing to be gained 
by engaging that conversation. Yeah. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about the civility project and the conversation groups, United as Neighbors, with that desire to, hey, let's have conversations. The hard, because there aren't a lot of hard, hard conversations, especially from the time you grew up to now. I think there is a much, um, I mean, some people would use the phrase divided. I think there's there's a much more equal split politically than than there used to be, which obviously leads to um, contention. And I think it can also lead to us really deeply considering what we believe. And I, I think it can lead to productive conversations. And you've been a part of several of those events and organizations, haven't you? It's like the conversation groups and stuff. I joined the conversation group a year ago, right after the uh, Old Fashion Festival. is where I, I was introduced into it a year ago. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a, a very interesting group. It, it is, uh, well, just so your audience knows, what we are trying to do is have conversations with people who we disagree with without being disagreeable, <laughs> without being mean, without preordaining what the other person is thinking when they're asking the question. But honestly, listening to the question and responding to it, you know, carefully and civilly. Um, I think that the group has a, a lot of merit. It has my full support. In fact, I, I have in my wallet a uh, small version of the... of the uh, With the pledge? Yeah, the pledge. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome. And I think it's... Um, I appreciate your support. I'm kind of... The podcast is kind of loosely affiliated with the United as Neighbors um, name, I suppose. And I really think that's something that the a lot of the contention and disagreement in Newberg, I think those groups are, uh, it kind of reminds me of when there's a fire and then after the fire, there's more growth that happens. And I kind of see that as some of that growth. And I, I really hope more of the our population can can get involved in that and and even if they can't come to the specific conversation group events, uh, embrace that ideology of disagreeing with being kind at the same time. And I think it's okay to disagree. We're always going to disagree with people. Sometimes it's very, very deeply core hell beliefs. And when people disagree or vilify those opinions, it can feel like a personal attack. Um, it, it just takes practice. So, um, so anyway, I guess... One of the other things, uh, moving on, so the election um, to now, it's been eight months yeah. since you've been in office. There's several things you've been working on as mayor, different projects, initiatives. So what are some of those projects and where are we now with those? Well, we've had uh, we've, we've had quite a few things come up. The most recent, and this was a, an item that I campaigned on, was, it's in the weeds, but uh, systems development charges. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Newburgh, we use systems development charges as a method of providing infrastructure for future growth. Uh, roads, highways, or I mean, roads, sewer, water, uh, and wastewater, store, uh, stormwater, I should say. Uh -huh. It's, uh, you know, all that stuff is expensive. And the city decided a lot of years ago to not make the citizens who already live here pay for that, but instead put it on the uh, citizens who are coming to town. So the expenses add up to a lot of money, and it has to the system has to be managed carefully, or else the charges are either way too high or way too low. And it's a very complicated system. It uh, has a lot of moving parts, and up till now we didn't even own the uh, the process. Hmm. We had had to, we would have to hire a consultant. Interesting. I didn't know that. And uh, so because of that, they didn't update it very often. They just put it, uh, gave it an automatic increases based on a construction manual out of Seattle. Last year, the increase was 11 point something, as I remember. And we, the city council, said, wait a minute. And we wanted to change that. And the staff pointed out that you can't change it. It's in your ordinance. So... Uh, we began a process in August. We sat down with a, with a very good group of Newburgh business people, residents, and um, and also staff and city council members. There are three city council members: Molly Olson, and myself, and Mike uh, are on that committee or were on that committee. 
And we started out by learning about the process. You know, how does this happen? Where do these charges come from? By the way, the SDC is on a new house right now, total about $40,000. So it's, it, it's insane. So me and real estate, you and building, understand that when we talk about affordable housing, it's essentially impossible if you have so many charges and permits just to build the darn thing. And you, you can't make it affordable house because, I mean, that on top of labor costs and material costs. So and I'm sure you felt that quite a bit in your structure and many people in the industry. Um, so I think it's helpful to know. And I've heard a lot of people complain about it. And it was always just kind of this like, yeah, it's a bummer, but it's built in there and it's really hard to do anything about. So it's right. it's interesting to to hear. So, okay. So right now it's about 40,000 for new construction. Yeah, it's about 40,000 uh, roughly, give or take. Um, and uh, of that, 10, uh, about $9,500 is, is uh, park and rec fee. So we have nothing to do with that. The park and rec has to maintain that park. So we're looking at about $30,000, a little under 30000 for the city's portion. And uh, we, you brought up affordable housing. That is huge. We want to figure out a way for uh, mainly, sing or especially single parents, moms and dads, to be able to afford a house to raise their kids. Yeah. You know, as you know, as a real estate agent, Pretty darn hard, unless if you're a lawyer making that kind of money, uh, to be able to you know maintain a household and uh, and raise your kids and and work a job. So the answer has to be, you know, that we have to find a way to provide those houses. And one of the things that uh, we I intend to do is to build smaller ones uh, because if you can build a Oh, let's say a two thousand square foot house, and it costs you three hundred dollars a square foot. You should be able to build a thousand square foot house and have it build, have it cost three hundred dollars a square foot. But it doesn't work that way because they both need the same water meter. They both have the same STC charges. Uh, they both have at least one bathroom, which is expensive, and of course a kitchen. So we're already it's already a tough nut to crack just to just to make them affordable. But one of the things that we did is we structured the SDCs. So if you are going to build a house that's under a thousand square feet, so a real small home, um, you're going to get a 75% discount on wow. SDC fees. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, to offset that, to make it revenue neutral for the city, we determined that if, uh, if you build a house that's over 2,200 square feet, then you're going to pay a 1.25 multiplier on the SDCs. And of course, if you're between 1,000 and 2,200, you're going to pay the, the normal rate. So first thing we did is we were able to bring the SDC fees down about $3,000. And uh, uh, just by removing items from the uh, future list that uh, didn't need to be there, uh, don't need to be there. And so that helped. But the, the next thing we did is... Our city manager, Will Worthy, who is a, a wonderful, uh, organized individual, created the, had the staff create the matrix. And so he now has a spreadsheet. So every two years, we're going to be able to revisit this. And so we don't need the automatic increases or decreases. But every two years, we will compare it to our capital improvements list and see if it's still the right amount of money we'll be able to adjust. I love that man. He's he's done so many amazing, innovative things. That's yeah. It's anyway. Well, what's what's old is new again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, that the uh, and then the other thing we did um, again on the SDCs. Do you remember XL Fitness used to be an Uber prior to the pandemic? Yeah, Down, I'm trying to remember where they were. Down in the south of the airport. Okay, yeah, on Highway 219 in that business center, uh, they were a they were a gym that a lot of new residents were members of, and had been there for many years. I'm not sure how how long, but during COVID, a couple months into it, their lease came up for renewal, and if you remember right, they were shut down. They had no business at all, and their landlord. Now this is all second, and this is from the the owners to how this went down. But I'm uh, the landlord said we need to sign a new lease, and the owner of Excel said, well, that wouldn't be wise because I don't have any income. 
And he was told, well, okay, but you're going to have to move. So he started looking for less expensive places. Uh, and he went around the corner on Winooski Street and he found a warehouse. And it was much smaller, less expensive, but it was big enough. It was still 5,000 square feet, and he thought it'd be just fine. So he uh, talked to the here. He went to the city to find out how much it would cost. And they said with SDCs, it was going to be $230,000. That's exactly what he said. So he spent a few months arguing with the city, trying to explain to them that this was a real simple thing. He couldn't afford $230,000. If he was forced to have to spend that, he'd have to choose to close his his, uh, uh, his gym down. And he was told by the city, well, okay, that's what it is. And so he did. He closed his gym down, and now he has one location in McMinnville. Um, so in our SDC process, we talked about that, SDC. And I know several people who looked at doing business in Newark and got the same sort of answer, and they just went away. In fact, I was one of them. After, my, uh, after I shut my framing company down, I thought, you know what? I'll, buy, I'll get a food cart, and I'll start selling breakfast burritos. So I called the city of Newburg, and this was before I was mayor, uh, before I was run out. And uh, I asked them, how much would this cost? And they said, $34,000. And I said, do you have any idea how many breakfast burritos I'd have to sell just to gross $34,000, let alone that? And they said, yeah, it didn't matter. That's what it is. So as we were looking at the SDC fees in the committee, we said we wanted to eliminate that change of use SDC. And the staff warned us once again, as if we hadn't heard it enough times in six months of looking this over, that we have to make sure we're paying for infrastructure. So I asked the question, how much does the city make on this particular SDC? Well, the answer wasn't available today, but I can call you tomorrow. So uh, one of the other members, Bob K, looked at me and he said, I'll bet it's zero. And I I said, yeah, I'll bet it is too. Sure enough, the next day we got the email from our uh, engineer, and she said that it was easier to do than she thought because it was zero. Uh, so we were able to eliminate a fee that is driving business out of town completely, and it won't cost the city a nickel because nobody's ever paid it. <laughs> so <laughs> all those vacant businesses downtown are probably vacant because somebody has looked into renting them and found out that there was a big, huge yeah. system development charge fee, and they said, no, thank you. So the uh, the Chamber of Commerce at our last council meeting came, and uh, Merrill Kunkel, and thanked us for changing that SDC because now she thinks that we will be looking forward to filling up those vacant you know, uh, storefronts yeah. in Newburgh. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, it's kind of exciting to be a part of this. Kind of makes me wonder why I had to come along to ask that reasonable question. You know, it's interesting. And that's kind of this this thing of there's always different priorities and values. And, and some things are, um, I mean, just an example with, uh, well, I guess when this is published, it'll be the recent cleanup on Roger's Landing. So you're part of the Morning Rotary Club, right? I, am. I don't know if, if you'll be joining um, us down there, but there's a big cleanup project, and it just took looking at it, and I realized why has this not been cleaned up? Like this is gonna, this could be so amazing. This, this could be a much better spot, um, and it just turned out no one had ever asked a question, and or sometimes pe people maybe ask the question, but then what's the next step of saying, okay, let's do the hard work of of doing this. My guess is because it hit you in a sore spot, being on the receiving end of some of those things, both as a business owner and, and as construction, there's a pain point I was enough to say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to make this happen. Whereas for most people, it's going to be, oh, that's unfortunate. It, that's that. Right. So um, I think it, I think it had a special place in your in your heart in this form of a, of a sore spot, not being able to do business the way you wanted to. Well, that. That's, I think that's very insightful. Uh, uh, you know, same with you and uh, Rogers Landing. You know, the the county, who knows if they would ever come and do that project. Well, no, because they only have one person on their whole, their whole staff. 
It's like, I can't do this entire thing by myself. So, um, and no one had ever offered to, to come and help. How surprised were they when you asked? Um, I don't know if they were surprised, but they were very pleased. Okay. They said, that yeah. sounds amazing because yeah, we know it needs help. And I mean, CPRD here, and sure, there's a lot of expenses that could put into CPRD, but they also do a lot in terms of parks and all this stuff. With the county park system, there's not a priority given to parks. So that's why, you know, if that was earned by CPRD, it'd be a very different um, place. But um, without getting too much into that, yes, they were they were very, uh, I'd say, pleasantly surprised, probably. Right. So what other projects have in the last eight months have you been working on? Oh, boy. Um, yeah. Get it. I mean, learning. Uh, certainly a lot to learn about, you know, how government works. I mean. Have you been surprised in any ways? Like, oh, I didn't realize this worked this way or. I'm I'm always surprised by how long it takes to make change and how hard it is to make change. Um, you know, it's like the SDCs. Well, I could have told them what the problem was and we could have written a, a, an ordinance and changed it. But no, no, we've got to go through a project, process that takes six months. And that just to get us to the beginning. Now, we're these changes we're are, we're trying to get done by next year, April first, which is when they will they'll be implemented. That's when a new budget year starts. So for planning and and building. So yeah, the the amount of time and effort it takes to change is it amazes me. Always has amazed me about government. Uh, but we're uh, let's see. I was just saying, can. I should have made a list of the things. I wanted to talk about the SDCs mainly. Yeah. Um, well, we can probably come back to some of the other things, but one of the points you made um, when one of the things you, I think, can, or a, one of the things that kind of first made you think about uh, running for mayor was the the whole point of car camping. Mm-hmm. And, and it's interesting from my own personal standpoint, not that I've camped in a car, but from volunteering at a local organization called Love, Inc., we see a lot of people who have been um, car camping and a lot of it is they, I mean, like what you were saying, like a single parent who, whether there was a divorce or it was an abuse situation and they had to leave and now they can't afford, they can't afford to to stay anywhere for many, many different reasons. And they're afraid to go to the shelter because there's sometimes people on drugs there. They don't want their kids around that. And, and the best option to them is to stay in their car. So that standpoint, you know, there's a part where my heart goes out. And at the same time, if there's a car that's in my neighborhood, I don't know who lives in it and I've got kids and I don't know what that person's situation is, that can feel uh, concerning. And and we also don't want, I understand not wanting to make it an ordinance that just, hey, just everyone can be anywhere. So there's that tension again of of wanting to take care of people in need and then recognizing that there's, there's got to be a, a better way. And we also have to think of people who, you know, if, if there's someone who can legally just park in front of your home every single day and you can't control, you know, they may be on, on drugs or in, say, not that there's not people on drugs in houses and that kind of thing, but yeah, that, there's that, there's that tension there. So how do you, and I'm sure you've heard many of the other sides. So how do you wrestle with that tension? Well, this, uh, First of all, because of Measure 110, we have people coming from all over the country to the West Coast, Oregon, Washington, California, because they're allowed to use drugs without being harassed. So make no mistake about it, a large percentage of the people who live in our in our shelters in Newburgh, in, in Yamhill County, in the state of Oregon, in Portland, are drug addicted. Uh, you know, we talk about people who are mentally challenged. And unfortunately, with the drug epidemic that we have going on, um, it's hard to tell who is mentally challenged and who is just simply on drugs and and who is mentally challenged and uh, that gets exacerbated by also being a, uh, being a drug user. So in my opinion... If we wanted to do something about homeless, and I'm not sure the state of Oregon wants to do anything about homeless, that's an entirely different conversation. <laughs> um, step one would be make drugs illegal again. 
And when I say illegal, I don't want to throw people in, in jail for, you know, smoking a joint or, or uh, you know, even shooting up heroin. But since we don't have drug treatment centers available for that use, traditionally in our country, the jails have been that. And uh, there's nothing wrong with letting a person dry out from drugs in jail and then getting them into a treatment program. And if they finish successfully, removing the, uh, the conviction from their record. Because some people do, you know, not everybody intends, look, I'm sure nobody intends to get addicted to drugs and just work that way. So that's, that's, that's certainly one issue. Yeah. The interesting thing about car camping is the law already says that you can let one person live in your driveway in their car. And uh, I was one time um, I car camped. I, uh, I, I was out of the Army. I took a job for a farmer. Uh, I was living in eastern Oregon in a town that only had a few people in it. I decided that uh, I needed to go someplace that had some females. And uh, so I came back to Newburgh, and at that time we had an unemployment office here. And I went in to sign up for unemployment and found out I wasn't eligible because neither the Army nor farmers pay unemployment. So uh, anyway, uh, long story short, er, I ended up car camping. I found a friend who lived in an area of the country that actually had some jobs available. And he let me live in his, uh, actually sleep on his couch, but my possessions all were in my car for two weeks. And I was motivated during that time to find a job and to get out of that situation, which I did. So there's certainly some benefit to allowing people to, you know, to car cap. And like I said, you can let somebody car cap in your driveway. It's perfectly legal. And, you know, that eliminates all that. As far as having people living on the streets in their cars, you know, what benefit is that to them? Obviously, if they're in the street and instead of in somebody's driveway, they don't have people here. They don't have family here. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, for whatever reason, there's nobody here that can help them get that out of that situation. So by allowing them to live someplace in the street, whether it's in a car or on a tent, in my opinion, you're not helping them. You're only enabling them. And they don't need to be enabled that time. They need to be helped. You mentioned Love Inc. Love Inc. is a wonderful organization. And the best thing about Love Inc. and Habitat for Humanity, as, as far as that goes, is they require personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't give you anything and just to give it to you. And unfortunately, with the people who are living in our shelters and the people who are living on the streets in our state, they're given too much. Um, I like to point out to people that when they see homeless people here in Newburgh, they're not panhandling. And the reason is they don't need to. They have money in their pocket from other sources, all of them, you know, derived from your tax money. So uh, we, we want to help people. Our hearts are in the right place. Everybody who is trying to help homeless people has their heart in the right place. They want to do the best thing. But unfortunately, enabling them to live in, in circumstances that are outside the ordinary are probably not uh, how we help them. And so, in my opinion, we need to use organizations like Love Inc., uh, who have the training and the expertise and know how to help people and help them up, not just help them out. Yeah. Now, th there's another one that I know is a, there's a very divided opinion on with the, the Peach Trail Village. Mm -hmm. Um and I know there's been kind of some different different thoughts. And I think my personal opinion is I think there was a lot of narratives given out that maybe weren't quite um, what was accurate. What What is your thought on on that? Well, I, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but I was one of the chief petitioners on the Kids Not Camps petition, which was started because my interest was that I was fighting the car capping initiative in Newburgh and the folks who wanted to stop the uh, Peace Trail Village from building a transitional home, uh, transitional housing center right next to a school, uh, sought me out, and we talked about it, and, and I, I helped them out. Um, back then, yes, there was a lot of misinformation. Uh, they were, uh, the types of housing that they were going to build 
they were building. They had three of them sitting on their on their property. One of them was occupied full time. The other two were. I know some people had lived in there for at least for a short period of time. Um, they were put in at that site illegally. First of all, they're not. They they weren't safe for living in. Uh, in other words, they had no egress exit. So if you were inside one of those buildings and a fire started between you and the door, you had no way to get out. You would have died in 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 the. Uh, and that's why we have public fire safety laws is to prevent that. Um, those homes weren't inspected. They you know they were built. They were basically home built uh, travel trailers. And Newburgh had just finished, or what they called the middle housing legislation. You can build an ADU in your backyard now, uh, an auxiliary dwelling unit, and uh, you. But the 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 two things that they did not allow in Newburgh, uh, they did allow tiny homes, cottage clusters, duplexes, triplexes, quads, um, and I seem like I'm leaving something out. But uh, but what they specifically did not put into it was tiny homes on wheels and travel trips. And the reason is they're not safe. They're not designed for somebody to live in full time. Um, so anyway, when I became aware, because there was an article printed that showed what they were doing up there, I went up and I, I drove up there and I saw it. And I could tell by looking at it as a contractor that none of the work that they'd done had been done properly, inspected. Um, they were not, they didn't get permits for anything. They didn't have any inspections done. They were, they had just tapped them into their existing sewer, which should have been replaced back in about 2017 when they came into the city. They should have been required to hook up to the city sewer. Um, and uh, so anyway, the, uh, myself and another gentleman uh, both pointed it out to the city and we were kind of snowballed. Uh, I mean, uh, our planning department didn't seem to care, and that was not characteristic of our planning department, who I've dealt with before, and they're usually um, very rigid about what is and what isn't allowed. Now, Peace Trail Village, Jared Jones has made the statement to me that they were told back at the time that they could put those houses in there, and if any neighbors complained, they'd have to take them back out. Well, okay. So I guess there you go. You know, uh, they thought that nobody was going to complain. So what they're trying now, they, they eventually moved. It took the city quite a while to act, but they eventually moved people out of those illegal units. And uh, they told them that they had to apply for permits to do it properly. So that was my objection to Peace Trail Village. Yeah. Now, if they, they are now proposing cottage cluster, which anybody can do in their yard. Uh, you could do if you have a room in your backyard. You could you could build a cottage cluster yourself. But these are going to be houses on foundations that are going to be inspected. They're going to have the proper fire life and safety measures required. And you know, hopefully, they'll be done in such a way that it won't irritate your neighbors. Yeah. So that's what they're able to do now, or what they're allowed to do, and what they're attempting to do. Uh, I. Uh, so the city has been a big supporter. The city gave them over four hundred thousand dollars, and um, you know we'll see where it goes. Yeah, no, it's interesting to hear that perspective because you know he's you he here. Well, I, get, I think the original kids not camps. It seemed they were presenting it as a homeless camp. I don't know if that's how it was presented to you. Um, whereas I think the actual idea of what it is, it's the thing that cottage clusters on foundations. To me, it seems like a good idea. Maybe you're kind of of the same. Opinion. If it's done properly and there's cell proper codes and everything, uh, but those small units, I think if we, it's having something like that where maybe rent is only several hundred dollars rather than two thousand dollars a month will allow people to um, get out of their cars and and you know live in a stable housing and hopefully get clean if they're on drugs. Um, but yeah, no, it's interesting to hear that thought though. Um, well, look. The cost of that project now to build it correctly to code is going to be $1.8 million is what the last figure Jared Jones gave me. Actually, Leslie said 1.5 at her council meeting the other day. But either way, 
it's pretty difficult to build houses for that kind of money and rent them out cheaply. Yeah. How how many are going in there? Is it seven, eight? eight? Yeah. What is 1.8 million divided by eight? I don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. Nine. It's less than a single family yeah. house. Two hundred to build eight five hundred thousand dollar houses would then be what like four million. So I guess you're about half the cost, which doesn't necessarily mean you can rent out for half the price. But uh, the good news is they're going to be able to take advantage of our new um, SDC change, and that's going to save them twenty thousand dollars per unit. Yeah, so well, good for them. <laughs> One of the other things I know you and Will have been working on is eliminating the, the debt. And at some point, Will's going to come on and he'll share a little bit about that. Um, and there's a couple other things we got to talk about in interest of time, though. What What is kind of your your thought in terms of let's get rid of the city's debt? What will that allow us to, to do? Well, that's uh, fiscal responsibility is something that I believe in. And when I met Will, after I got elected, actually, he told me about his his uh, need to eliminate the debt in Newburgh. And as some other people have pointed out from time to time, I'm not sure that the city needs to be absolutely without debt, but it's a nice goal, isn't it? You know, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't spend money on paying interest and we could therefore have a little bit more money to fix our roads? Uh, so it's the fiscal responsibility thing to do, and I'm absolutely in support, and I'm glad to be a partner. Yeah, it, you, is it? I don't know if it's is it public information how much money is spent on interest per per year? Yeah, it sure would be. Uh, okay, but I don't have that figured. I'm sure Will would. He's the one. He's all the numbers and everything. <laughs> well, I'll have to have him on, and he can talk about that in more detail. But I'm excited about it. I think I know it's a significant amount. And if that could be eliminated, it would it would allow for a lot of other cool things. But it's a big project. I know he's put a lot of his own personal stake in there. Um, all right. So the next one is just kind of broadly in general. What is your vision for the future of Newburgh? You you've done some things with SDCs and um, some other things, but how do you see the future of Newburgh? Well, I never saw Newburgh as being a bedroom community to Portland. Um. Unfortunately, with the loss of the mill and our recent history of being unfriendly to business, we don't have a lot of industry here in Newburgh. We don't even have a lot of commercial, you know. Um, so we're going to become a bedroom town community if we don't do that. There are no jobs here. So my goal, or our council goals, I should say, uh, is to increase the amount of industrial land that's available. Um, increase the amount of and, and of commercial land available, and generally make Newburgh a friendly city for people to do business in, so that yeah. we bring the employers back in and people can live and work right here in town. How much of, how much of that has to do with the old mill site and what's happening there? Well, the mill site is is of course central to that issue because I think they had about two hundred and fifty jobs, two hundred and forty so if I remember correctly good, high-paying jobs. Uh, so we've never replaced that. So ideally, we would find some businesses that would not only replace that, but add some more more jobs than that. Uh, and, you know, that's a very re- realistic goal. Yeah. It's a, it's a good piece of property. It's uh, in a good location. It has excellent access to I-5 south of New River without going through any towns. And uh, so we, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get a good employer. And I think changing the fee structure uh, so that we are competitive will make it possible for that to happen. Are are you able to share anything of what what's currently happening with that right now? Where things are in that process? Well, um, the the folks who are selling it, has been in contact with Doug Rucks, uh, the planning director, more than more than council or even the city manager. I do know a few things. I do know that there's uh, uh, there's at least one large company who's already in our community to, to some extent who's uh, trying to purchase it. Um, that would be a, a very good thing. Uh, I do know that uh, there has been some interest from a server farm at one point 
And I really don't think that 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 would be a good business for Uber because once the construction's over, it employs five or six engineers, which are good paying jobs, but it's just not enough. And it takes a lot of resources. So we, I don't think that this, I'm speaking for the council and I need to be careful, but my guess is that this council would not be favorable to that sort of business. We're really looking for business that can bring jobs to Uber. Yeah. And I would, I would happen to agree with that as well. I used to live in the Dalles and there was okay. a big server farm there and they employed several people, but it's not the type of place where people can come and, um, and I guess if it's industrial, not just commercial, I kind of think, and I think at one point someone compared it to a river. They had a big industrial area, but it was a place where people could come and it was, it was a very much a community spot. So, I mean, that's kind of up to, um, anyone's guess of what kind of business is going to be interested, what's going to happen with the whole riverfront master plan and, and all that. Um, but yeah, I personally hope that it's, um, and is it just one parcel or did they split it? Uh, I was. Oh, they will split it up. Okay. They, too. Yeah. They, you don't have to buy the whole thing. I'm. I'm sure. I'm guessing. Okay. I'm not had that conversation, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure they'd be happy to sell it to more, multiple. Do you have any guess on on what kind of timeline we're looking at as when these kind of things might happen? Because they finished last year. They finished the final demolition. My understanding is they're maybe do, still doing some environmental cleanup, and and then from there it'll be ready I, to sudden build. I think that they're just about full scale trying to market the property at okay. that point. So, you know, you know that world better than I do. Uh, <laughs> Less so on the commercial side, but I'm interested in it. And I, yeah, I I live right over in that in the new river run division on the south side of town. So um, it's going to have a big effect on on us. Have, if there's a place we could go and walk to. And um, I'm, I'm personally really excited. I think the, the, that in conjunction with the Riverfront Master Plan, how that all works together, this is going to be exciting in the next few years. So I just, I mean, same thing as you, everything takes so long. I wish it could be next year and not, you know, hopefully it's not another five to 10 years, but we'll see. And I would bet that it's going to, I, I would bet you're going to see at least one major pur purchaser, um, hopefully before the end of the year, but, but certainly within a year. Of, oh, wow. Uh, you know. And then of course, depending on what they're proposing, there's a lot of time in construction. It's sure. Permits or permits. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, what is what's the message that you want to give to the community as mayor? Well, I would like folks to understand that the state of Oregon has deemed that our cities are going to be much more dense than they have been in the past. And I'm not necessarily a big proponent of density, high density, but that's what we have to deal with. Uh, the uh, House Bill 2000, or yeah, 2001, I think, uh, which was written, authored by Tina Kotak, who's now our governor, uh, and is law now, you know, states that uh, any place that you can build a single family residence, the city has to allow them to put in uh, a, a tidy home, a cottage cluster, a duplex, a quad, a fourplex. And even under with a type three review, multifamily. So wherever you live, not so much at yet at yours. If I, your lots are, are narrow Basic, and long. Basically, already a cottage cluster. Yeah. <laughs> but if you live in a more traditional neighborhood in Newburgh, and your neighbor's house burns to the ground, or or puts it on on the market, somebody could buy it and put high density housing next to you. Uh, in fact, there's a lot on. Uh, on North Crater, uh, that is, has been available for some time. It's almost two acres, and uh, they're going to put 31 condominiums on it. Oh, wow. Uh, they'll have 47 parking, off street parking spaces. And, you know, in that neighborhood, that's uh, uh, parking is, is already tough uh, in that area. Uh, but that's that's the density that our governor has deemed we're going to build and like it or not. It's, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate. I mean, from the standpoint of affordable housing, there's an element that in some ways that's what's needed, but it's also hard when you're in the neighborhood and it's affecting, you know, it's it's interesting to have 
multifamily or high density right next to lower density. It's kind of a, um, but yeah, like you said, it is, it is what it is. Well, one last question I'd like to ask everyone, um, what, given you're the mayor, you've been here a long time and you've seen the good and the bad, but what gives you hope for the future of Newburgh? You know, the, uh, we, we started talking about the conversation group and what I have discovered, uh, I've certainly not the first to discover this, but, uh, when I sit down and talk with people who disagree with me vehemently on, on, uh, politics, when we sit down and actually have a conversation, we agree on a lot of things. And if we just talk about the things that we agree on first, and we present ourselves as reasonable people in a very short period of time, we can start talking about the things that we disagree on and we can have districts of opinion, but still respect each other's, you know, belief. So I have a lot of hope for people. Uh, I believe that already you've, you've seen the temperature of conversation coming down in our town. I certainly have. Uh, I just, uh, I think that we, are going to learn to get along again. Uh, we don't have to change our point of view. We still can keep our, our closely held beliefs, but if we respect the other people, uh, then the truth is we agree on a lot more than what we disagree on. So that's... You know, I, I agree with that, and that's actually really great to hear because that's a huge part of really the mission behind this podcast, even as I... Obviously, I know people are going to have their beliefs, but to be able to be kind again, maybe get off social media... Or don't um, don't allow people to uh, to just spew garbage and maybe stand up and say, "Hey, let's let's treat each other kindly." And I I think really Newburgh is starting to to see the culture really stand up and say, "Hey, we're we disagree, but we're going to still be kind." And um, yeah, I'd love to see more more ways to do that, more ways to facilitate that. But yeah, I agree with you. I'm very excited, and I, I think we're going to see more of that. Well, thank you, Bill, so much for uh, your time today. Thanks for um, all your work as as mayor. I know it's not an easy job, and in many ways, you can uh, can make some enemies. But I think you've also done a lot of good. So I appreciate appreciate that, and you taking the time today. All right. Well, I appreciate you giving us this opportunity. Uh, you know, I love this town, and I know you do too. Uh, so you know, hey, Newburgh, let's let's start talking about things we love about this town and let's quit we're dwelling on the things that we disagree about what was your motto again forward together forward together all right well thank let's you. let's move forward together is yes thank you for tuning in to the giving town podcast if you enjoyed this episode please consider sharing it with a friend who you think might benefit from hearing it while more and more people are continuing to hear about this podcast i still need your help to spread the message about all the people and organizations that make newberg so great Well, thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next episode.